everybody knows. Um, we will be recording these sessions so that people that aren't able to watch it, or if you want to rewatch it again or share it with some friends, it will be on our Nebraska Game and Parks Education YouTube channel. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started today. Like I said, we're going to be talking about birds. Um, May is Nebraska Bird Month, and there's just a lot of cool things to talk about birds. And I know a lot of um, some of my coworkers are on here today. They always kind of, kind of. Um, make fun of me a little bit because birds are very cool, very, very cool birds and very cool animals. Um, they're not my like forte and they're not my like absolute, I don't have shrines of birds and like photos of birds on my phone and stuff like that. I'm more of a reptile person, but um, I do love birds. And when I was, I was researching for all of this, I'm going to give a shout out to Allie here. I don't think she's on, but I, she might be listening. Um, I walked up to her and said, I think I really like birds now. And um, I was talking about some cool birds and some, some cool topics and things that I learned about. So I'm really excited to share that um, with all of you. Thanks, Amber. We're so proud of you. I do appreciate that. I do um, want to say that birds are pretty cool and I'm excited to share those cool things with you today. So um, it is kind of a lot of information thrown at you. And when I was doing this and, and um, making stuff for this PowerPoint presentation or this program, there's a lot of stuff that I didn't even touch on. Um, birds are kind of a huge subject. So I'd really try to focus on some of their anatomy. Um, I didn't even talk really about migration, but I am doing a science of migration coming, um, I think in September. Um, so when I start the fall series, you will definitely hear more about bird migration then. So if you think about it, like, well, she didn't really cover migration. Nope, I didn't because there's so much stuff about birds that I wanted to get in. So, all right. So I'll go ahead and um, share my screen here. So we're going to be going ahead and talking about birds today. Um, hopefully everyone sees that big, maybe in a second, there we go, the big version of my PowerPoint. Thanks, Laura. Awesome. Um, so this is a cool little white-breasted nuthatch. Um, we have these in Nebraska. Um, you might see them quite a bit in your yard. Uh, we'll be talking about them today, but um, if you look really closely at their feet, um, Allie taught me this today too even, they have this little tiny claw um, that helps climb. And we'll talk about that in a little bit later, but just kind of noticing how cool birds are and the cool little features that they do have. So my name is Monica. I am the wildlife education specialist for the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission out of Lincoln office. Um, so I do just kind of want to make this clear to everyone. I'm sure we won't have an issue, but if you do have any comments or questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, Laura's my moderator today, and she certainly can help answer those. And we can certainly have time for questions in a little bit, um, but just make sure they relate to the topic at hand, that you're nice to everybody. Um, I've never had a problem, but, um, and I don't think we're going to have one today, but just wanted everyone to be aware of those. All right, something else I also wanna point out, I am by means no bird expert or any expert on any of these topics that I'm talking about. Um, I do a ton of research and um, read a lot of books and, and love animals and love science. And so um, I, I don't pretend to know everything. So if you do have questions that I cannot answer today, I would love to follow up with you on someone that can answer them and get you those answered um, at a later time. So, all right, so let's go ahead and talk about birds. So. Birds have been around quite a while. Um, they have a lot of history in them, not just in Nebraska, but in the world in general. Um, so when we talk about birds, they are one of the most prominent animals as far as mythology um, and literature um, throughout the world, not just in the United States. Um, long before people even knew what or even called it ornithology, birds were being a part of science and they were being a part of conversations and stories um, in lots of different cultures and places around the world. Um, for instance, ancient Egyptians had hieroglyphs um, or paintings that had birds on them as well. Um, even the Bible refers to Noah's use of the raven and the dove to bring information. Their supernatural beliefs, uh, a lot of them kind of surround ravens and crows. Um, if you've ever heard of like the Salem witch trials, they believe that the, all the witches had, um, can't think of the right word that they use now, but um, like a partner kind of in crime. And a lot of those were things like toads and ravens and crows. So sometimes they get a little bad of a reputation, but um, it just kind of goes along with that culture and that history of them. Um, however, though, people, for instance, in the Pacific Islands, they see frigate birds as symbols of the sun. Um, ravens also get kind of a bad 
reputation as well. Um, thank you, Edgar Allan Poe, with your use of the raven, um, the, the story that I'm sure all of us know. Um, but eagles are symbols of power. Um, the phoenix, if you've ever seen Harry Potter um, and lots of other shows and movies, they talk about the phoenix being this rising from the ashes and um, like a symbol of, um, of help and, and things like that. And then birds are even on money. Um, they appear almost everywhere. So um, I have a couple different uh, photos here of cultural stories stories, um, maybe some sci-fi kind of things that we talk about those birds. So they are everywhere to say the least. Um, as far as bird watching though, um, bird watching has always been a part of history. Um, we didn't always see it like we see it now. Um, obviously with a uh, change in technology and the different, um, you know, the life lists that people have as far as birds, it's changed a lot. Um, basically about the time that people started to understand what environmentalism was and understanding that we need to care for the earth um, and all of these different things, bird watching rose with that idea. Um, there was also this idea of what they called shoot and stuff um, in the 19th century basically bird watching became a sport um, it was who can identify what the fastest and obviously the rarest birds um, were the most rewarding to see because um, you don't see them very often and then um, binoculars helped as well so even in the early uh, 20th century binoculars started coming about and being a, a part of bird watching and obviously as that technology grew the amount of birds that you saw grew as well you could see farther people understood how to use them became they became became more readily available. Um, something else was that um, a lot of it, people, people shot birds. Uh, they shot them. It was a sport. It was a thing um, that kind of changed about the 1900s. A lot more people started seeing them and sighting them rather than shooting. Um, and that's still a, a big thing today. Bird watching is a huge part of ecotourism, especially here in Nebraska with like the sandhill cranes. Um, people come from all over the world to see the sandhill cranes in February and March and April. Um, but there are also still game birds out there. Um, and it's a big part of our, our culture here, not only in Nebraska, but in the United States. Um, and then bird watching also advanced with field guys. And then as photography got better, and even that sound recording, um, people started really getting into birds and bird watching. So bird numbers, like where, where are we as far as this? Um, there's about 10,000. It kind of depends on what website you looked at or what book I was looking at. Anywhere from 9,000 to 11,000 species in the world um, that have been recorded. But obviously scientists think that there's way more out there. We just, we discover new species all the time. Um, larger animals like birds and mammals, you know, are a little bit rarer to find, um, but that doesn't mean that they're not out there. Um, in the United States, there's about 860 species. Um, within the world, we are ranked number 23 as far as countries and the amount of diversity goes. Um, Colombia was actually number one. They have about 1,800 species um, of just different types of birds within their country. So a little bit smaller than the United States, but they rank huge in the amount of species. They're in that tropical region. They have a rainforest. They have lots of different diversity of birds. So where are we with Nebraska? We have about 452 species of birds in Nebraska. And this is um, sometimes rare birds that have been recorded once, or this could be things like cardinals and grackles. So things that we have all the time. We have three endangered, five threatened species um, as far as a state status goes. Um, this is a little bit sadder of a statistic here, but more than 150 bird species have gone extinct in the last five centuries. And scientists estimate now that there are about 1400 species that are threatened with extinction. So out of that total number of bird species, about 14% are threatened uh, with going extinct. So kind of a sad story on that, um, but it is, it is the truth. Um, and a new study that I just saw, and some of you bird people out there might've seen this too, about three days ago, um, there was a, an estimate that said how many birds, like individual birds, we think we have in the world. And it's anywhere from 50 to 430 billion birds. So billion with a B, that's a huge number. Um, and I just want to say thank you, community science. So this was a huge undertaking and a huge part of community science and people putting in that data, just regular people, um, not necessarily scientists, but community people, regular people that would put in those numbers. And that is something that was helpful in gaining that estimate of how many birds that we have in the world. 
All right. So we'll go ahead and talk a little bit about just what is a bird? Um, what do they look like? What is their structure, anatomy, that kind of stuff. All right, so what is a bird? Um, this is a lot here, but when you look at a bird, they're warm blooded, they have vertebrae, so they have backbones. Their body temperature is a little bit warmer than mammals. Um, so a normal human being, for instance, 98.6 is normal. Um, there's some differences now saying that might not be exactly what it should be, but overall birds are gonna be just a little bit warmer than our mammal species. Um, birds are actually more related to reptiles than they are mammals. Um, I had a professor in college that always would say that uh, birds are just reptiles gone bad. Um, I'm gonna shout out to Dennis here, but uh, I don't know if that's true or not, but they are related to each other. They have a four chambered heart. Their forelimbs, instead of having arms, they are modified into wings. They produce hard shelled eggs. Most birds have fairly good vision, not all of them, but some of them do. Um, their sense of smell is not highly developed. Um, they do have a sense of smell, but it's very, very poor, um, except when we're talking about turkey vultures. We'll get into that later. Um, the auditory range is limited. Most birds are diurnal, but again, we know that there's some that are not. Obviously, owls are not diurnal. Um, they do have ears, but they are not visible external ear lobes like mammals or people. Uh, and they are in the class, which is called aves. And the major characteristic that that sets birds apart from any other animal is feathers. Um, no other animal has them. All right, so as far as a skeleton, um, what's underneath all these feathers and all this muscle? What does this look like? So this is a photo actually of a dodo bird. So don't go off of that, but um, it was a good photo and I, I liked the photo, so. Um, but a bird skeleton over time, when you look at them and you break it down, it really depends on the lifestyle of the bird. Um, a American red start is gonna look way different than a gull or a albatross or any of those types of birds because their lifestyles are gonna be very different. Um, the major limb bones are hollow, but they do have internal struts that help support them. So a lot of people believe that birds' um, bones are really breakable, they're fragile. They're actually very strong, they're just lighter. Um, so a bird's leg bones, for example, um, depending on the species, but they are often heavier than those of a similar sized mammal or reptile. Because if you think about it, that is their only support when they're walking, when they're running, when they're hopping, anything. Um, we know that some birds fly, some birds do not. Um, so as far as the birds that fly, they needed their uh, skulls, they needed their skeletons to be um, very light so that they can, they can move and they can fly. Um, so a lot a lot of the things that have been lost is that birds do not have teeth. That's a huge weight um, off of something. And then also those teeth have to go into something. So they have those really large, heavy jaw bones. People have those. Birds do not. So that has taken a lot of weight off of those birds so that they are able to then fly. Um, a lot of birds also don't have usually a long tail. And if they do, it's only feathers and they're very light. Um, so that nearly all of that tail reduction and a reduction in their skull. Um, flightless birds don't really have a need for something called the keel or the sternum. Um, so you know where our sternum is here in our chest. Sometimes that's called a keel um, in birds. So some flightless birds have it, some do not. It just kind of depends on the species. Penguins are actually ones that do have that because they have such strong muscles to help them glide through the water. They have to attach somewhere and they attach to that sternum. All right. So in birds that do fly then, um, their muscles take up a lot of space and a lot of weight on their body um, as far as that small amount of weight actually goes. Um, but the wings attached to the part of the breastbone called the keel um, is basically just an enlarged sternum. And then the skeleton has to become very rigid. Um, this helps the birds basically by fusing um, the vertebrae, um, fusing the collarbones. And sometimes we call that a wishbone. Sometimes we call it a furcula um, in birds here but then really adding um, special lateral growth. They're called, um, un is it uncinate processes um, on the ribs? So basically what happens is it just strengthens that whole 
rib cage. So they have their collarbones, they're fused together to make that wishbone of that furcula. And then off of that furcula, they have these tiny little processes that strengthen the rib cage because all of those flight muscles, all of those wings and feathers, that weight is on there. It has to be really strong as far as their um, chest goes. And then the thorax of the bird is going to be a little bit shorter. So the legs are closer to the wings and the center of gravity. This helps the bird balance and it kind of just makes the bird a little bit more compact when flying. Um, the leg actually does not extend past the knee joint. So the backward joint we always think of is like the knee of the bird. It's just their ankle. So it is actually a little bit different as far as people goes. Um, you can kind of see in this um, photo here, um, the sternum is kind of way down here. And then you're looking down at the digits um, where we think that's the knee, that's the ankle. All right, so then looking outside of the skeleton. So feet are a huge um, thing about birds. It's easy to tell their life cycle from that. It's easy to tell their eco ecology from that. Um, their feet are gonna tell us a lot about that animal and it's, it's kind of it's gonna tell us um, their lifestyle, their habitat and where they're gonna live throughout the world. Most birds have four toes, not all of them. Usually three are facing forward and one is in the back. Um, some, however, like woodpeckers, they have two in the front and two in the back, that's zygodactyl. And then that usually that big toe um, is called the hallux. Um, so that bird that has three facing one and one facing back, that hallux is gonna be that one that faces backwards then. Um, it's extremely important for the bird. Um, we talked about this, their feet are the only source of support when they're standing, they're walking, they're running. Um, and again, it helps us know the ecology of that species. There are certain types of feet um, when looking at them. So for instance, um, this Carolina wren here is known as a perching bird or a songbird. Um, the warblers, the wrens, they're going to have these very independent, flexible toes. Um, you can kind of see here in this photo, 3.1 way, one points backwards. Um, so when they perch, um, it, it seems like a lot of work to hold on to that all the time, but it's very similar to a cable tie. So once it's on, it's, it's locked in and it's very little energy for that animal to expel to perch. Um, so even though it looks like a lot of work, it, it's really not for that bird. All right, so what other types of feet are we looking at? Woodpeckers, for instance, they have two feet pointing, uh, two toes pointing forward and two pointing backwards. We call that zygodactyl. Um, it helps the bird climb up and down the, the tree um, or even um, like the bark. Uh, water birds, they're gonna have sometimes webbing between their toes. Um, gulls, for instance, they have feet very similar to that, but it's not necessarily for, um, uh, swimming is so that they don't sink in the mud when they're looking for their food. Um, wading birds, big birds like herons and cranes, they're going to have very large toes and long toes that spread out the weight over a large surface area. So again, they can walk in the mud and the kind of wetlandy areas so they don't sink. Uh, raptors, they're going to have very large claws. We call them talons. Um, these are to kill, capture, and carry their prey. Pheasants and chickens, they have very strong feet. Um, they're going to scratch at the dirt and the leaf litter. Um, oftentimes you see chickens scratching to find their food or to dig up seeds, things like that. And then there are some flightless birds, um, penguins, emus, cassowaries. They have very strong, powerful feet. They kick and they have very sharp claws as well. So claws, um, I believe is the correct term for birds that are not birds of prey. So talons um, is what we usually say for birds of prey. Claws are in fact claws when talking about non-birds of prey. And then I also threw in this cool bird up here. This is a coot. Um, if you, this very top photo here, the kind of lobed uh, feet, they're just kind of the I don't know, whenever I think of bird feet, this is what I think of. They're just kind of cool and they're different and this helps them um, survive in their habitat. So coots are kind of water birds and this helps them in their lifestyle. All right, so here's just kind of a diagram of um, lots of different types of birds um, and their feet arrangement. So the zygodactyl one and the heterodactyl are very similar to each other, but it just depends on which digits are forward and which digits are backwards. Um, you can also see the things like the heron here, um, the grasping of the eagle, there's ducks that paddle, the perching sparrow, um, the zygodactyl, that woodpecker again, you can clearly see two in the front, two in the back, they make like an X almost. And then things like a pigeon, they're just hopping and clinging onto branches. So they have kind of, I guess, normal, um, unidentifiable, undistinct feet.
All right, so bird beaks. Uh, bird beaks along with their feet are a great indicator of their habitat, their feeding, their diet, their ecology. You can tell a lot by a bird by looking at those two things. Um, so lots of different types of bills or beaks um, is a correct term, I guess, bills for birds. Um, if they're short and thin, you can probably assume they're going to be insect eaters. If they're really thick, kind of short beaks like a cardinal, they're going to be seed eaters. Um, some birds have very long, thin um, beaks that they're going to use to, uh, like hummingbirds that they're going to use to probe into mud or flowers. And then those really strong hooked beaks that we use for tearing meat, like in our raptors or our birds of prey. They're not just for eating though. Um, there's a huge role in sexual selection, um, debating on their beaks. So um, the usually the male and the female and um, identifying what the female usually likes or what the male usually likes can play a role in how their beak is shaped as well. Um, there are a few, um, so how their beak is made, they're these separate, basically horny plates that are put together and they're fused and it's made of keratin. So keratin, um, you might've heard that being used before. You have it on yourself. It's your hair, it's your skin, it's your nails. If you've ever seen or touched a snake, their scales are made out of keratin. A turtle shell is made out of keratin. Um, the horns on a bull are made out of keratin. So it's just a specialized protein that is in a ton of animals and they use it um, on their bodies. Um, no birds will chew, so they don't have teeth. Um, they do have what we call a tomia, very similar to in turtles. Um, their lower jaw also does most of the moving. It's not necessarily their upper jaw. And then when you get inside of their bills, they do have um, tongues. A lot of them are just kind of, again, undistinct, just kind of there. Um, but then some are really highly evolved. For instance, like woodpeckers, puffins, cormorants, um, hummingbirds, parrots. Um, we went to a uh, uh, was an event a couple weeks ago and they had a macaw there and they were telling us that they were feeding him um, like raw almonds. And if you've ever eaten an almond, you know, there's that kind of thin brown coating on top of it. And then when you strip that off, it's pale and plain underneath. So their um, parrots, their um, beaks were so highly modified that when he gave him an almond, he would literally take that brown coating off and then spit that out and then eat the undersides that inside. So just, they do that without arms. They do that arms and legs. They did it with um, nothing but their beak and with their tongue. So it was kind of cool to hear how specialized their beaks were and their tongues were. All right, as far as eyes, what are we looking at here? So very similar in structure to a human eye. However, um, they make up a huge percentage of the weight in birds. So just in a normal bird, about 15% of their weight for a common starling is their eye. It's about 1% for humans. So we don't have very heavy eyes. We can move them side to side, up and down. We don't have to move our whole head like owls do. Um, so bird's eyes are usually relative larger um, in size to their skull. Their skull is lighter though. They don't have teeth. They don't have those heavy jaw bones. So it's okay if they have a little bit more extra weight with their eyes. They also, like we talked about, they don't have a lot of movement. They're very tightly fitted into their skull. So when they move to see something, they usually move their whole head. Um, owls, for instance, they can turn their heads not all the way around because if they would, they would fall off. So they only turn them around about 200 degrees. Um, people can not do that. I think it's like, what, 180 degrees to something like that. It's not even close to what birds are. And then birds, just like mammals, or sorry, just like reptiles, they have three eyelids. Um, they have the normal ones like we do, and then they have something called a nictitating membrane. So if you look at this photo here, you kind of see like half of this, you know, little, um, looks like plastic or little like gelatinous sheath coming across it. So that is that nictitating membrane. So basically what it does is it, uh, it's a lubricating duct and it cleans and protects the eye. Um, for instance, like in alligators, they have it. So when they go underwater, it's like built-in goggles. So they can see underwater without having all the crap come into their eye. All right, so this was kind of cool. Um, so what birds see and what we see are two totally different things. So birds are what we call tetrachor 
tetrachromats, which means they can see four different colors. So they can see UV colors, they can see blue, they can see green, and they can see red. Um, humans only see three. They can see blue, green, and red. We can't see that UV. Um, so birds, um, they also see this whole spectrum of colors that are completely invisible to humans. Um, there was a study done um, where humans, we saw similarities um, in about 92% of species that looked identical to each other, but birds, they see so many different undetectable colors that we can't see. So this really helps male and females see each other in a different light. And there goes that sexual selection again. Um, so if you look at these photos here, um, the first one on top, the black colored bird, that's what people would see. The color or the colors and the bird on the right then, that is what the bird is seeing. So there's all these spectrum of colors that people do not even see. So if you saw this bird in the wild, you'd be like, well, it, it has bright orange beak or yellow beak, but a bird looking at this bird is seeing greens and purples and blues. So all these different things that people are not seeing. And then this bottom photo here, human vision versus bird vision. So um, just a little bit different. And then um, in a bird's eye towards the center of the retina, um, you have this special um, structure, um, fovea centralis. And what this is, is it helps the bird see very clear and very sharp images. Um, they also have these receptors in them that basically just make everything clear and easier to see. Um, we have about 200,000 receptors per millimeter squared in our eyes. Sparrows have about 400,000, but when you look at something like a raptor, a vulture, or something like that, they have about a million receptors per millimeter squared. So it's just how good their eyesight actually is. But not all birds have good eyesight. Um, kiwis actually have very poor eyesight. They actually will smell to find their food. We'll talk about that. But again, this is not all birds. All right, so do birds have ears? A lot of people think they don't because they don't have those external ear lobes like people do. They do, but they're just not very visible. Um, so basically what it is, if you've ever plucked a chicken, um, they have openings, that is their ear. So it consists of an opening, a tube, and then the internal parts that people, very similar to what people have. Um, they are seen sometimes from the outside, um, covering these, they have what's called barbless feathers. Um, so, or sometimes they're called ear coverts and it just kind of protects them. Um, especially when they're flying, it pretends from, protects from turbulence or dust or um, anything else that could get in their ears. Something that's also kind of neat is that birds, they can recognize an absolute pitch. So they can hear something and mimic exactly what it was. Humans, we can kind of get close. We hear that relative pitch. Um, birds also can hear shorter notes than humans. Um, human processes sound at about 1 20th of a second. Birds do it at about 1 200th of a second. Um, they can hear as many as 10 separate notes at a time and know the absolute pitch for all of those notes at once. Um, a lot of people also think when they see this great horned owl, for instance, a lot, I hear a lot of kids say this too, and adults, they believe that these two little um, like tufts on their head are their ears. They're not, um, they are feathers. They're just kind of upright feathers. Um, with owls, something that's kind of neat is their ears are asymmetrical with each other, which simply means that one is up farther, the other is down farther. Um, this basically creates something called binocular hearing. Um, it basically is like surround sound. They can pinpoint with extreme accuracy on where something is. So it just helps them hear better. Um, a lot of birds though, they do have symmetrical hearing. So right next to each other on the same side, same location like humans do. Um, they're just gonna be a little bit different in birds of prey, especially owls. All right, um, can birds smell? A lot of people think they can't. There's some debate between ornithologists, um, kind of what the consensus is that yes, they can smell, but it's not very, um, it's not highly evolved. They, they can smell kind of, but they don't really need to. Um, a lot of people think um, basically there's no practicality in it. They don't really need to smell. There are certain birds that do, however. Um, we talked about kiwis earlier. They have very, very poor eyesight, um, but they hunt worms based on their sense of smell. There are some uh, birds called tube noses. They can detect the smell of fish oils on the sea. And then of course, vultures, both new world and old world vultures can smell to some varying degrees. 
Um, birds also do have two nares or nostrils on the top of their mandible or their bills. This is how they breathe. Um, so they breathe through a series of three internal nasal cavities. These purify the air, it changes the humidity. Basically before it enters the lungs, their lungs are really delicate. So it needs to basically purify everything before they can get into um, when they breathe, before it gets into their lungs. All right, feathers. This is the most prominent feature in a bird. Um, every bird has feathers and everything that has feathers is a bird. This is the undeniable feature that nothing else has. Um, they provide insulation, which a lot of people think that um, feathers evolved for flying. That's not really the case. They evolved for um, keeping that insulation. And then later on it became, hey, these work pretty well. Let's use them to fly. Um, the colors also allow for camouflage, um, a lot of sexual characteristics, sexual display. Um, they evolved from reptilian scales. So birds still have scales on their feet. They have scales on um, sometimes their head if they are kind of a naked um, head animal. And then their feathers evolved from scales as well. Um, over time, they become warm and worn and they're replaced regularly. We call that molting. Depends on the species and it depends on where they're found, but they usually are replaced twice a year. All right, so feathers, um, basically when you look at a feather, that central shaft is very hollow. Um, people will call that the rachis. Um, so the side branches then come off um, into finer sub branches in contour feathers or the main feathers that you would like find on, a, um, on the sidewalk or something like that. Those side branches then are called barbs and they're linked together through barbules and little hooklets. Um, the base uh, where there are no side branches, so way down farther, you'll notice here, that's called the calamus or the quill. Um, this is the hollow entrance where the blood would flow to the vein of the developing feather um, when it was alive. And then birds um, have different feathers that perform different jobs. There's flight feathers, there's down feathers, there's contour feathers. Um, contour, like we talked about, if you would find a feather on the ground, more than likely it's going to be a contour feather. These are the largest ones. It gives the bird their shape and the color. Um, and it includes both flight feathers called um, remiges, is that it? And then tail feathers are the retrospective. All right, so bird feathers, they're made of keratin, that same structure, that protein that makes up your hair, skin, nails, um, all of those different things. Owls, for instance, if you've ever looked at the owls or the wings of an owl, they're kind of serrated at the very end. This just helps make them quieter and helps with that silent flight so that they can sneak up on their food. Um, in very primitive birds though, there are some birds that their feathers just kind of grow at random, um, but most birds have defined rows and patterns um, where those tracks will grow. Um, a hummingbird, I thought this was kind of neat. Hummingbirds, you know, very small. They only have about 940 feathers. Um, there's something called a whistling swan. They had about 25,000 feathers as far as their winter coat was concerned. And then the longest feathers came, they were in an ornamental chicken in Japan, um, and it was 34.75 feet long. That's a huge feather, tail feather. And then the longest wild feathers were in the crested Argus pheasant. They are about 5.7 feet long. So they're very highly, highly, highly diverse as far as feathers go. All right. So colors of a feather. So there's structural pigments and then there's pigmented pigments. So pigments are basically molecules that interact with the light um, and they reflect certain wavelengths while absorbing others. Um, there's two different types. Um, this um, carotenoids, basically these will produce red to yellow hues um, and they only will come from the bird's diet. So if you think of pink flamingos. Um, they're only pink because of the certain food that they eat. Um, so one of the problems is when um, zoos first started having flamingos as far as an exhibit, they had a very hard time keeping their pretty colors. They just couldn't figure out what to, to feed them and how to make this diet work. But now that they got it figured out, you will see pink flamingos in zoos. Um, you will also see melanins. And these are the um, structures that produce um, black to grays and browns. There's also structural colors. Um, basically, this relies on the interaction of light waves um, and how they are reflected off of each other. Um, a lot of times, if you've ever mixed oil and water together, you will notice there's kind of that really pretty kind of iridescent um, look on it. This is kind of the same, um, same principle of the matter. Um, it basically is just an interaction of light waves. There also are no blue or green birds. It is just the way the structure of the light reflects. So blue, like this blue bird here, 
we're not really seeing blue. There's no blue, but it's just how that um, light is reflected in all directions. And then green color is actually made from that blue structural color and then yellow pigment in birds. So which obviously makes green. So that is why we see green. All right, so that was a lot of information, I know. Um, I saw the chat, there was quite a few things. Um, what are some things that we are asking? We've had a lot of good curious questions about flightless birds having hollow bones like birds who can fly. And someone commented that their chickens have tiny white bumps on the back of their beak that kind of look like teeth. Yes, um, they do. I guess I've never looked a, a chicken in the mouth before, but I'm assuming that helps with seed grinding and whatnot. Awesome. All right. Well, we will just keep moving on then. Thanks, Laura. All right, so a little bit of reproduction in birds. Um, so we know that birds lay eggs. Um, they laid hard shelled eggs. Um, they consist of four basic parts, the shell, the white, the yolk, and then something called the germinal disc, which is basically that DNA of the female cell. Um, shells are covered if you've ever touched a chicken egg. Um, they're kind of a grainy in texture and they have thousands of little pores. This helps with gas exchange um, and they are semi-permeable. So air and moisture can go in and out um, of that shell for that developing embryo. And then this germinal disc, um, I'll show you a photo here in a second. It's just like a little spot of cytoplasm that sits on top of the yolk. Um, and again, that's the DNA nucleus of that female cell. Um, Here's a photo of it. Um, there's another better photo that shows that germinal disc here in a second. Um, there's something also called, um, basically that encompasses the yolk. It's um, just a clear casing of it. It's made of protein fibers, has protein receptors in it. This is helpful for sperm recognition and binding. So when that um, sperm goes to bind and fertilize the egg, this is like, oh, I know what you are. And it helps recognize that and helps bind it to that to help fertilize that egg. The yolk is something that we eat a lot. Um, it's the yellow part of the egg. It supplies nutrients to the developing embryo. Normally it's spherical and suspended in the white egg. Um, sometimes if you've ever cracked open like um, an egg, they go to bake a cake or something, you might notice that there's two. Um, double yolk is what people call it. This is what happens when the ovulation occurs too quickly. Um, this rarely will produce a chick, but sometimes it does. Um, and then the color of the yolk depends on the animal's diet. So usually kind of a pretty yellow color, but it can be really orange to a deep orange. Um, the darker the color, the more fat the bird has been eating. So here's um, the, that germinal disc that we were talking about, that little um, membrane that kind of encompasses the yolk, the white part, um, the air cell down here. Um, a lot of the times, if you ever go to make like deviled eggs, for instance, or um, hard boiled eggs, this is an easy way to crack that open, um, but that is that air cell. All right. So the white part, the albumin is what we call it, makes about one third of the egg and about 90% of that weight is water, proteins, minerals, and fats. It also um, contains globulins that help provide immunity from diseases. Um, that egg is and the developing embryo are pretty helpless. And so this is the way that they are able to um, survive and protect themselves. Um, when the chick is ready to hatch, it acts, um, this albumin part basically acts as a lubricant to help turn the chick and help it move around and then push itself out of the egg. And then something that I also found that's kind of neat is that um, in most birds, about average, about 12% of the body weight of a female is an egg and she can lay multiple eggs and in over multiple days. So 12% a day is just that egg. Um, I think we, the other night I found out that a kiwi is 20% of weight and, and that's crazy to me. So um, some birds, I also found that uh, they will get some extra calcium for those eggs, um, for their shells. They eat paint chips off of houses. So um, this is how they get some extra, extra calcium carbonate for those eggshells. All right. As far as egg shapes, they come in like five basic shapes. There are more. There's like simple round balls. This is our owls and our woodpeckers. There's pyriform eggs, which are top shaped eggs. There's plovers. Um, a lot of times they'll have this. There's really long eggs. This is a bird that has a very narrow pelvis. There's long thin eggs, which basically when you spin them around, they go in circles. This helps with cliff nesting species so they don't fall off. And then an oval egg, which is usually like the most common type of um, shape that is like in a chicken, for instance. 
All right, so hatchling. So baby birds, they hatch in two distinct forms. There's something called precocial and altricial. So precocial is they come out, they're fully feathered, they're ready to leave the nest straight away. Those are like ducks. And then the altricial ones are the best example I can do. Everyone's seen a pigeon. They hatch within a few feathers. They're able, not really able to stand on their own. Um, they need help from the mother. It's gonna be a while before they leave that nest. Sometimes there is an intermediate stage where the birds will come out fully hatched and ready to go, but they still rely on the parents. It's just, again, that lifestyle, that habitat, where they're living, um, predators, that kind of thing. So they help with two things um, when the baby comes out to hatch. There's sharp project projections on top that we call an egg tooth. This simply helps them break out. Um, they also have this um, special muscle in their neck called a complexus. Um, it enlarges when they go to um, bang and scrape their way out of the shell. And then once they hatch, it kind of decreases a little bit and it comes reduced. And then there's also something called synchronous versus asynchronous hatching. So synchronous is when all the eggs are laid at the same time and they hatch at the same time. And then asynchronous is like in red-tailed hawks, one will hatch and then the others will follow after that. Usually what the parents will do is they'll spend a lot of their time and their energy and their food on that firstborn. And then the others kind of just gets what's left as far as food goes. All right. So that was kind of, I, I, I missed a lot of stuff, I know. And if you're like, she didn't cover this and there's tons of information out there on birds. I could probably do a science of birds too. Um, but I did wanna highlight, I think five or six species in Nebraska that are either kind of underlooked or that I think are really cool. Um, and that I just really wanted to show you guys today. All right, so first one is black cap chickadee. So um, thank you, Allie and Amber for uh, talking to me about chickadees this morning. Um, I When Allie first said chickadees, I was like, I see those all the time. Like, why are they such a big deal? Um, there's a lot that I did not know about chickadees. Um, they're one of those birds that kind of hang down, um, upside down oftentimes to reach the underside of branches. They actually can hover which I didn't know, um, that more than half of their diet is animal prey. I really see these guys as seed eaters because they always come to my feeders, but in fact, they eat lots of insects, spiders, eggs, larvae. They often store food um, to recover it later. And then one thing I found today is that um, a lot of the times animals will know these birds as danger calls and they kind of follow these birds um, because it helps them know um, if there's danger around. The chickadees are kind of doing all that work there. And then something that I found just kind of really fascinating is that chickadees can delete some of their brain information and get rid of it and so they can get new information. So during the late summer and the early fall, their hippocampus, which is part of their brain, this is involved in spatial memory. So um, when they store that food, they need to remember all those storage locations. So they basically take all the useless stuff out of their brain, delete it, and then their brain will grow. And so they can hold more memories and fresh things. So they know where they're finding their food and where they're putting that food. So I thought that was kind of cool. I did not know that a black, about black cap chickadees, um, but now you know. All right, double crested cormorant. So these guys, I think I really like them just because I think they're kind of scary looking and I like scary looking things. I like scary things, but um, a lot of people don't know we have them. A lot of people see them as more like uh, marine kind of animals, but we do have them here in Nebraska. Um, a lot of people see them in the water because they're diving, they swim underwater to get their food. Um, they also look wet all the time. So they have preen oil, but they have a little bit less of it than other water birds. Um, this is actually a good thing. It helps them be more agile and fast when they're underwater. So their barbs basically, um, they get wet and they kind of stick together. Um, and then when the bird feels like that it has about, the average is about 6% added water body weight, they know they need to get out of the water because otherwise they won't be able to fly if there's a predator around. Um, so they forage by diving from the surface and swimming underwater. They eat things like fish, frogs, salamanders, basically things that you would find by the water. They are relatives of our frigate birds and our blue-footed boobies. Um, they accumulate fecal matter, a lot of it underneath the trees when they nest. And it oftentimes, because of the foods that they eat, it kills the trees. So when that happens, they leave to go find another nesting site. Also, they will use um, dead bird parts of other animals um, and they use it to kind of weave and put into their nest. Um, large pebbles are often found in the nest too. And we're not really sure, but the birds seem to treat them like eggs themselves, even though they're just pebbles. I'm not sure why, couldn't find that out, but um, it's kind of an interesting fact. 
All right. Another bird. Um, I'm like, I'm sure people are like, I see these guys all the time too. You might not know you're seeing them actually. So white breasted nuthatches, um, the females will use cavities and trees, and then they will line that cavity with kind of a grassy nest. Um, something that's cool about these birds is that they will um, basically kind of wipe or sweep their area with bark strips and crushed insects. Um, scientists believe that they have a very strong odor that either masks the bird's smell or it repels predators. We're not 100% sure, but they think that's the case. Um, these guys are one of those that have those three feet, three toes in the front and one in the back. You can see this bird's um, down here, this really, really long claw. This is basically to help them brace and to climb. Um, so unlike woodpeckers, they don't use their tail to brace. Um, so what they will do is they move their feet in different um, sections. So their um, front foot will actually um, help and then their back foot will be the brace and um, and then vice versa. They're also the only bird in the world that can go face down on a tree. Um, and then females and males are very hard to tell apart from each other. But when you look at them, the crowns are gonna be different colored. So the male is gonna have kind of a shiny black crown and the females is gonna be gray. All right, this is probably my new favorite bird in the entire world. The, these two next two are my favorite. Um, if you've ever heard of a loggerhead shrike, um, sometimes people call them the butcher bird um, as their um, nickname. It's basically a songbird, but they have raptor habits. Um, these guys will hunt from telephone poles, fence posts, and other high perches. And they eat insects, birds, lizards, small mammals, but they don't have any talent. If you look at this bird, it's perching and it's, um, it's clasp around this little tiny branch. They don't have claws and they don't have talons. Um, so what they will do is they capture their prey and then they will literally stick it or skewer it on um, thorns, like on a locust tree or barbed wire, or even wedge them into super tight places so that they die and then they can come back and eat them later. Um, and something that's kind of neat is they're not that big, but they can kill and carry off an animal that is the exact same size as they are. Um, someone was talking about their chickens having those like kind of projections in their mouth. These guys have them too. They're called tominal teeth um, to fit with their what we call tomia or their beak um, or mouth parts. Um, something else is that they will kill things like monarchs and toads, but they know they're poisonous. So what they will do is they will literally skewer them and let them sit for a couple of days so that those poisons and toxins will break down and then they don't eat them and get sick. Um, fledglings, they will also practice this like skewering behavior. They will basically like practice impaled gestures and peck at inanimate objects to practice um, for this um, life as a basically a raptor bird without being a raptor. And then again, sometimes people will call them the butcher bird. So very, very cool. If you ever look up loggerhead strike, most of the time you'll see um, them with photos of like a lizard on a barbed wire or a different bird or a mammal or um, a rodent or something. So they are quite fierce little tiny songbirds. All right, and I did save the best for last. Um, turkey vultures are my favorite bird. They're very underlooked and very underappreciated. Um, so a lot of the times when you see these birds, they have their wings out in the morning. A lot of people think that they're warming up. They're trying to get that sun exposure. There was one theory that someone had that when they open their wings for the sun to hit them, it refreshes the curvature of their wing feathers and kind of gets them ready for the day to start flying. Um, Again, just a theory, um, but these guys also, we talked earlier about birds not having a sense of smell. They have some of the largest olfactory bulbs ever in the history of ever. Um, so very good sense of smell. Uh, people used to think that they would fly around and search for their food by smelling it, but new study kind of says that they can't really smell that far away, that they kind of use other cues um, in finding these animals. And then as they get lower, they start to smell their dead food. Um, they also, if you've ever watched a turkey vulture, they look like they're very unsteady when they fly. Um, this is because they fly in a dihedral shape um, where they tilt the wings, it generates more lift and it helps basically level the bird out. 
Um, one of the cool things is if they get threatened, um, they will vomit over each other, you know, no big deal. Um, the babies will do it as well. If they get hot, they will defecate or urinate on their leg. Um, kind of like the same principle as when you get out of a pool in the winter time and you're all wet and you feel chilly, same concept. Um, one of the cool things is they have so much acid and bacteria on their face and on their, um, in their gut. Normal birds have about 76 species or types of bacteria on their face and their gut. Turkey vultures have 528 on average. So lots of bacteria, lots of acid, lots of cool stuff that help them um, survive and live in this, this lifestyle as being a scavenger and eating carrion. So very cool birds, totally overlooked. All right. That was my birds. Um, one, there's a lot of information. Again, I know um, it's so hard to pinpoint and pick things that I want to talk about. Um, next week, Thursday, May 27th, same time, 3 to 4 p.m. Central Standard Time, we're going to be talking about animal architects. So these are animals that build their own homes. We're going to be talking about um, birds, spiders, bees, um, beavers, lots of different things. And then as far as our summer schedule goes, we run all the way through June 24th. We're going to be talking about um, trees and shrews, voles, and moles, um, sturgeon, some differences that we have in nature, like difference between frog and toad, difference between wasp and bee. So lots of cool things. All right, and then if you really like this and you want more, we have an education YouTube channel. Um, for those bird nerds out there, we just did a nature nerd night on Tuesday um, talking about ladybirds and how they um, kind of run the bird world. We talked with Allie Mays, our community science education specialist, and also Jason, the bird nerd, St. Sauveur. Um, he works at um, Spring Creek Audubon Center and he was awesome. And we talked about birds. So you could watch that later under nature nerd night. Um, under our YouTube channel. We also have a Facebook page, an Instagram page, and then just a general wildlife education website as far as our Nebraska Game of Parks goes. And then um, this is all they have um, as far as this, but please join us next week for Animal Architects. And then we'll open it up for questions. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen, but I do wanna let everybody know that I will be sending everyone that registered um, a um, email as far as an evaluation goes. And we'd love to know what we're doing right, what we'd like to do better, um, some more topics that you'd like to see covered, that kind of stuff. And there might be a little bit of an incentive, just saying, if you fill out one of those, uh, one of those uh, evaluations here, we got some cool science of stickers for you. So might be getting one of those if you possibly do fill out an evaluation. So we appreciate any feedback that you have to offer. So all right, um, at that point, we will go ahead and open it up for any questions. I did have a question just pop up, Monica. Um, does the Audubon app contribute to the community science program for identifying birds? Ooh, that is a good question. I am not sure about that. I know there are community science programs that are specific for identifying birds, but I'm not sure if the Audubon one does. Do you know if they do, Laura? I'm more familiar with Cornell and the Merlin okay. app and eBird. I know those um, lists. Um, you can do like with your Christmas bird counts and um, other community science things. Uh, Cornell can use. Uh, Cornell can be used, but I'm unfamiliar with Audubon. Um, it looks like someone said, no, you need to use the eBird to accumulate that community science um, info. Someone asked why the eBird app is so difficult to use. I have heard that as well. I am not someone that does use it, but I have heard that it's not the most user-friendly. It's more for those like, and correct me if I'm wrong, anyone, like super big bird nerd listers. Like if you've done this like for 20 years, this is your app to use. Um, I think iNaturalist and maybe the, you said the, the Cornell one is a little bit more like beginner kind of bird friendly or people friendly kind of thing. Yeah, um, Merlin is the Cornell's version. Okay. Um, but yeah, I'll be honest, I've not done a whole lot of birding by app. <laughs> I, I still use my guidebooks. Yeah, same here. And yeah, if you are looking, and I can put this in the email that I send all of you to, but if anyone's looking for like a really good beginner bird guide, either for kids or for yourself, um, this Birds of Nebraska book, you can get it on Amazon. It's like 13 bucks, but it goes um, by color. So a very easy way to kind of get people interested in that. You say, oh, here's a really common brown bird. I don't know what this is. There's like a hundred brown birds, but you can look at, look through it and see um, which ones that you're finding. So, um, and I can certainly um, put that in the email too, so. 
Awesome. Well, um, please remember to join us next week. We're going to be talking some animal architects. So um, three o'clock to 4 p.m. Central Standard Time next Thursday, May 27th. So, all right. Thank you, Laura, too, for doing this. I appreciate it. Always. Thank you. All right, everyone. We'll uh, talk to you later.